Hi, everyone. Welcome to True You Podcast, a storytelling space for self-discovery, where we take this safe and brave space to address racial trauma and healing for Black women through our own lived experience. I'm Kelly, and this is my co-host. Hi, I'm Debbie. We're a mother-daughter team having real conversations about real issues shared by and for Black women because we have something to say. Absolutely. And hi, everyone. As always, um, like we say, we're back with another great episode. It's really a cause for celebration because this month, October, we hit two years going strong with True You Podcast. Uh, And I feel especially blessed to be able to share this moment with my mom, who said yes to be a part of this journey with me. Mom, can you even believe it's been two years? It, I mean, it's amazing that we have been going strong for, for two years, and it is a cause for celebration. Uh, two years is an amazing achievement on social media. And Kelly, I'm so grateful you asked me to join you on this journey. I've started listening to some of the other earlier podcasts, and we've had some wonderful guests and some thought-provoking topics. And today we have another wonderful guest, and I'm so excited about our special guest today, who I have known for over 20 years. She is my sister in Christ, and she's also my sorority sister as well. Gail, how are you doing today? I'm doing well. Um, Very excited about this and just blessed uh, that God has given me an opportunity to be able to share my experiences uh, with those who have gone through um, the journey that I've gone through and to not be selfish, but to be giving. Amen. Thank you so much for your comments, uh, Gail. Thank you. Yes. And we have a great informative topic today. But before we get into that, as members of Delta Sigma Theta sorority. I'm not a member, but I have a question for the both of you. So lately in social media, a topic came up that I thought was a little interesting. Um, There was an incident not too long ago of a a young little white girl. She's in the second grade. She came to school with a sparkly AKA sorority t-shirt on. The teacher um, happened to be a member of the sorority and made the little girl take the shirt off. She gave her another shirt and then she uh, sent a note home to the mother explaining that AKA items are branded and trademarked for members only. And that was why she she took the shirt. She did not give the shirt back. She kept it. So, um, of course, the mother couldn't understand what the issue was. She said, why would she mix her personal affiliation, which has nothing to do with the school? And she didn't have a right to take the shirt, which was um, something they received as a hand-me-down, I guess, from a friend, she said. So my question is, um, it was a lot of comments about this. And so I was like, oh, man, that's interesting. So um, what, what are your thoughts about this? Gail, I'll let you go first. I saw that social media post uh, and, you know, I've worked with children uh, in the school setting for a number of years. And, you know, me being a therapist and working with adolescents and uh, understanding children and their developmental stages and understanding how life situations create stressors for them. I thought about the situation and as, as, as a Delta, knowing um, how we are about uh, our uh, represent of our organization, I felt that it could have gone a different way, that she was a child and children don't always understand as adults do. So my thought was she could have possibly allowed her to wear the shirt because the question is, what harm was it going to do for that day? Was it going to crumble the organization that day? Uh, And then I would have called the mother and set up a meeting as a teacher, having a meeting with the parent and the child and explain to the parent 
why that shirt was not appropriate for her daughter to wear uh, and explain the background of the, uh, of the organization and try to help her understand the reasoning why we don't, uh, you know, don't really uh, want other individuals to be wearing the property of an organization. And at that same, same meeting, you know, have another shirt for the child to exchange it. And doing it that way, I feel you're educating the parent. Uh, you're sh showing the child modeling behavior uh, as an adult to say that, you know, we all have differences, but we all have to learn to be able to communicate, communicate and explain those differences and get a common understanding and agreement and move forward. So that will be a win-win for that child, seeing how to handle situations in the future when there's a disagreement in something where two people don't meet eye to eye. Unfortunately for me, I did not see that social media post. And um, I love the way you just explained it, Gail. Um, that's, uh, I mean, the child has no idea. All she saw was a, spur a sparkly, pretty shirt she wanted to wear. And I appreciate the way you explained it. Um, but on another note, I think about how you can even go online to Amazon and, and order whatever you like. It doesn't matter. You can just order shirts. So, you know, but at the same time, I, I believe we need to educate the parents uh, and make sure they do understand that because it is a trademark um, for that particular sorority or fraternity. And uh, other people do not have the right to wear it. They have not um, gone through or um, they don't appreciate I shouldn't say appreciate, but they don't understand the uh, the method or the message behind our sorority or our fraternities. So it's best to, to understand that first before you go and put something like that on your child. But let, leave the children alone. Let the child um, wear the shirt the rest of the day and then move on with mm -hmm. it. So uh, I hope that answers your question, Kelly. I, I believe Gail did a, a marvelous job. Yeah, it does. Those are good answers. Yeah. I think also on a, on the other note, wherever the friend who gave it to her, if she was part of that sorority, like they maybe should have been a little bit more careful in, in, in the apparel as far as uh, even like if you give, you give stuff to Goodwill, things like that. Um, just being a little bit more careful or, or just recognizing that you know, it's not for everyone. And, and maybe it was a better way of uh, <laughs> um, giving away, you know, the clothes. So, but thank you for those answers. Those, that was um, very um, informative. And I was just curious your thoughts on that. Cause it, it was a list of comments on up under that um, video. Okay. Well, I'm ready to hear, hear what our guest has to say. Today's topic is dementia and the Black community. And we are so grateful to spend some time talking to Gail about her experience as a caregiver and daughter whose mother had dementia. She is also in the process of releasing her new book entitled The Fading Garden, A Daughter's Journey with Dementia. And I have a three-part question for you, and I hope you don't mind. First of all, can you just kind of share your background? What is, um, tell us about who Gail is professionally, and um, then can you also share with our audience, what is the difference between dementia and Alzheimer's? And then finally, what made you write this book? Okay, great questions. Um, <laughs> a little bit about myself. Uh, I am a, a state licensed uh, social worker. Uh, I've been working in that career for over 25 years. And I worked at a not-for-profit agency 25 years of those, those years, uh, providing services to uh, children in the Chicago public schools. The agency was a school-based social service agency. And like I said, providing uh, mental health services to youth um, in elementary and high school pertaining to group counseling, clinical group counseling, individual counseling for uh, anxiety, depression, uh, behavioral issues, 
uh, trauma and also working with parents of those children to help, you know, to support the process and for their children to be healing and, and, and adjusting and learning and applying the coping skills to help them be successful in school. Uh, and uh, currently I retired, retired two years ago, and I am a practicing, I have my uh, private practice that uh, I am doing the work uh, with individuals from high school to seniors <laughs> doing um, individual one-on-one uh, -on -one counseling, which I find very rewarding uh, because of my prior work years. Uh, it was a lot of administrative work, uh, at scaling the programs. And when you work in admin and working in boardrooms and all that, you get away from the real work and the real passion that you have, which is helping others. And so I am grateful to be back in that space, um, providing therapy and helping people grow and being the best that they can be. Man, thank you, Gail. That's that's beautiful. It's nothing like uh, living out the dream that you went to school for in the first place and instead of getting into that administrative piece. Yes. Thank you. And I believe the second question was uh, the difference between uh, dementia and Alzheimer's. If you could look at an umbrella and visualize an umbrella and across that umbrella says dementia, that's what it did. Dementia is. It's an umbrella of symptoms that affect people's ability to perform everyday activities on their own. And when I say symptoms, the symptoms of dementia, you know, the common ones are, you know, a decline in memory, changes in thinking, poor judgment, reasoning skills, decreased focus, attention, changes in behavior uh, and language. So all of these symptoms fall under dementia. And Alzheimer's is a disease uh, that is most common, this most common types, because you have several types of dementia that fall under this umbrella. But Alzheimer's is the most common type, uh, which includes a lot of the symptoms that I just mentioned. There's also uh, vascular dementia, which is what my mother had. There's uh, the frontal temporal dementia. I think you might have heard about uh, Bruce Willis and his dementia, the frontal lobe. Uh, there's Parkinson's and there's uh, several other that fall under uh, that broad umbrella of dementia that there are specific diseases. So that's the difference between the two. Okay. Thank you, Gail. And so what made you decide to write the book? Well... The reason why I thought about writing this book is because as I was going through this whole journey with my mom, uh, I, I really felt alone in the process. And at one point, I didn't know what was going on. <laughs> I couldn't explain the behavior. You know, as our parents get older, as when you start thinking about senior citizens, you know, you think about sitting on a rocking chair and, you know, they just say anything they want to say. They, they, what's the old term? Oh, those are some ornery old people. But, <laughs> but actually not really realizing that those changes in behavior and the changes in mood has is more than just being old or aging. It might have something to do with how the brain is processing at that time and, and, co and cognitively how they're handling things, which the brain is, is managing all the emotions that, that are going through the body. And I didn't know this. I'm a social worker. <laughs> I didn't know this. So because I was right in the battle, I didn't think of any of this. And I wanted to write this book for people to help them understand what their loved ones are going through or what they will go through because I didn't know what mine was going to go through. Um, I had never experienced, uh, I experienced my father-in-law going through this process, but his was a lot different than my mother's. 
And he was a male, she was a female. And I didn't know what to expect with, with all of this. So I wanted individuals to know what their loved ones are going to go through and what they will go through. And I felt that just providing a story, telling my story, I felt that people needed something a little bit more tangible. I, When I wrote it, I thought about me. And I said, man, I would have loved to have something right at my hand where I can just pick up a book and something of the sort and just start, you know, I could read it and then I could just start writing something in there, my reflections, my thoughts. Um, I'm stressed. I, I could, you know, I got something to go to and pick something up right away to help me distress, something to change my focus, something to uplift me. And that's another reason why I wrote not only this is my story, but this is a tool that you can have it right at your hand. You don't have to do like I did. And I was sending myself text messages as I, you know, going on daily walks and trying to help me understand what was going on, put my thoughts and feelings in that, or find, you know, putting little messages in my uh, computer, typing stuff down and writing stuff down on a little notebook. It was all over the place. But I felt that if I had something like this, it, it would have been right there. And I just could have picked it up and just start. So that's another reason that I wanted to write this book. Another reason is, too, I wanted people to know what to expect when you talk about early onset dementia. Because you don't know. Um, with my mom, she would have these blackouts situations. I used to call them episodes. I didn't know what they were. You know, she was talking to me and then all of a sudden she just blank out and then she opened her eyes and she said, oh, where did you get here? And I'm like, hey, what's going on here? Um, or either easy agitation. You know, you don't, you just, pick, you know, life is life. Okay. We get agitated. We get irritable, but not really realizing that this is just a little bit more than just agitation <laughs> um, and missing time, you know, just blanks of time. So understanding what these early symptoms are might be and not just chip it off as top it off as like, oh, yeah, this, you know, she just forgetful. She just this. I mean, because I'm going to be honest. Yeah, I was doing that, you know, and that's what, that's what we say. And another thing is to help them become more aware like I said, the signs that I just dismissed. Um, closure. That's another reason why I want to write this book. Closure. Uh, my journey with my mother helped me learn a lot about her and about myself. Uh, we grow up as children. Okay, we don't know our parents' journey before us. And we don't understand why they are, why who they are and why they are that way. And that helped me understand why my mom was the way she was. <laughs> and it made us even more close than we had been. So that closure was perfect. No regrets. No, I wish I could have, I should have done, no, none of that, which definitely helps the grieving process. It helps because there's no guilt. You are just grieving because you have lost someone. And another, another reason why I wrote the book was because let people know you're not alone. Yes, I have family, I have friends, but sometimes, man, it just... You just feel like you're just out there by yourself, but you're not. But you're not. When you start talking to someone, you say, yeah, you know, my mom had that and I felt the same way. And I kept getting that same conversation. I felt that same way. I felt that same way. I felt that same way. And I said, you know, as much as you like to stay behind the scenes with things, Gail, <laughs> you're going to have to get out there. And put this out there for others. You cannot be selfish and sit in your little corner and say, I'm going to do this and I'm this is this, this is it. No. People have to know. 
people have to know there is a community of us out there and that you can connect through different resources. You can connect through uh, groups, support groups, help groups, um, but you're just not alone because there are people right now who are just starting this, starting this journey and joining this community. That's the reasons why I wrote the book. Thank you, Gail. I know I, I've i appreciated the parts that I have looked at already, and I, I, I thank you for that. Know that it is a gift to, to your readers. Thank you for your answers. I appreciate it. Thank you so much. Even the definitions that you provided, I've heard the mention, all of this stuff used interchangeably. So realizing like what it actually means is so helpful. And also just being able to share your story, just like what we do here. Um, you never know who, who you might be touching at that moment. And so that's why it's definitely a gift that, that you're giving someone else through listening to the podcast or even like through and definitely through your book. So I did do some research, interesting things that I, that I read about black people in particular are more likely than white people to, to develop dementia. And that according to the CDC, the center for the disease control, um, 14% of black people in America over 65 have Alzheimer's compared to 10% of white people. And they cited um, the disparity as even more likely due to being um, misdiagnosed and not receiving um, the same quality of care. A lot of other factors was just uh, interesting about the disparities. I was reading about the frustrations of a, a another um, young woman who the caregiver for her mother and just not being heard and, and fighting for medication to even ease the, the symptoms that her mother was having. And so um, I wanted to ask you, did you experience any of these things as you cared for your mother and as you went through trying to understand what was wrong um, in the early onset of her dementia? You know, I was, um, we were blessed. Uh, my mother was diagnosed when she was around 90 years old. My mom passed when she was 99. And at that time, you know, my dad was alive and they both lived together. And, you know, she, they were, she was slaving with her, you know, herself. We would take her, but it was, and she always called, yeah, taking this little blue pill. So we had her going, we, what we did was make sure instead of, you know, the your primary care doctor is great, but I knew we knew she needed a specific type of doctor, you know, and so we moved to uh, geriatric doctors and we moved to, you know, talking with them, explaining what was going on. Then they did a series of tests and um, they, she was able to get some medication. Um, it was, I can't even pronounce this, galatamine, galatamine, whatever, I can't spell it, but it, my mama called it the little blue pill. And, but the doctor said, it's not going to cure dementia. It's not going to, it's not, that she has vascular dementia. It's not, it's not going to cure it. However, it will prolong the stage till she gets to the final stage. So she was on that medication uh, for at least six years, about five or six years. And the thing about the medication, why, you know, it was off and on because the medication made her extremely sleepy. She would said, I'm having weird dreams and she would stop taking it. So we would have to say, okay, let's talk to the doctor. Let's cut it in half. So then she would start taking half, you know, which really, you know, helped with the, the weird dreams was really with hallucinations. Um, and it was always helpful as she got towards the end uh, she couldn't even take the, the medication anymore. And then we had to move on to some other types of medication to help with the uh, with the erratic behavior and hallucinations. It helps even more when when you have a doctor that is also has a parent that is going through the same thing, and that's what God had put in our in our path. Another physician that was experiencing the same with with her with her mother. So I always say. It's really important to have 
your loved ones, you know, with, especially as they get older, you know, with, with the, you know, geriatric doctors. Um, and cause there's a lot of tests they had to run on her to find out that she had the vascular dementia. Um, and that comes from like m- many strokes in the brain that's very faint and you don't know. And, and that, that what's contributed and pushes it through. You have to fight. You have to advocate for your loved ones. You have to push these doctors uh, who are not working towards helping you and your loved ones, the ones that are not hearing you, to, to make sure that you make sure they hear you. And you're right. Continue fighting for the medication to ease the symptoms because it it helps your loved one going through the process and it helps it helps the family. Yeah, thank you. Those are some some good points. And I'm glad that you didn't ha- you didn't have those experiences when it comes to feeling unheard and um it's interesting that you say there's there's no cure for dementia um and so I didn't know that. So thank you for sharing that as well. Yeah, thank you, Gail. Um and that's an another um thought too is a lot of our loved ones being misdiagnosed and the mere fact that you had a geriatric doctor uh, helping and working with your family, that, that is a gift as well. So yeah, thank you so much. Uh, so that your mom was able to receive the, the kind of quality care that was needed. So thank you so much. Um, well, several years ago, I, I lost my mom. And uh, as I read, um, just different excerpts of your book, um, your mom's last words to you in your book. It really triggered in me a final conversation with my mom. Uh, What was the hardest part about writing this book and what did you learn? The hardest part for writing this book was reliving the whole experience over. It's like when... When, as I mentioned before, when you're in the midst of it, you you you, you fight on that battle. And when I started writing this, um, it didn't it didn't go smoothly. Uh, I didn't start writing this till about a year ago. And as I started getting through each paragraph or two, and reliving some of my notes and and thinking about the situations. I, I, I couldn't, it, it was hard. I, I had to stop. So I would stop and then it would be, you know, another week or two weeks or a month would go by. But it was reliving the experience. And the crazy thing about it was after I had written so much and I went back and reread it from the beginning, it was, it was unbelievable. It's like I could smell, I could, it was so vivid. You know, the sights, the sounds, the smell, you know, everything about it. I, You know, I could still hear her laughing. I could still hear her uh, going through one of her little, uh, one of her little fits. I could still, you know, hear the conversations. I could hear and, and smell all of it. And that was the hardest part. But I think once I got through it, it wasn't hard anymore. Um, and what did I learn from this, my, from doing all of this? You know, it, it taught me that even, <laughs> even when you're in the valley, laughter can always be your lifeline. Because even in the book, there's some stories that I talk about my mom playing playing cards because she was the big she was the whisk queen even though she did cheat and I, I was thinking about that and she would cheat playing cards with me and my husband and it was it, it was just hilarious just to think about it or either when you know she'd have one of her little mood things and say she gonna do something to me and I started laughing at her even that would bring laughter but I mean it that's what this taught me that even in the midst of the valley, you can always find humor. And that is your lifeline. Um, It taught me that (laughs) 
everybody's going through this and everybody's story is going to be different, but the outcome is still going to be the same. But we just have to be courageous. We got to be faithful. We got to lean into our faith. We have to lean into our families. We have to be able to ask for help. We cannot sit in isolation and think, okay, we got it. You know, you might be surrounded with family, but it's you still have to reach out. And people love you. They want to help. You just got to reach out and take care of, and take care of yourself. That's why I have a lot of self-care and, and, and coping skills um, activities in this book and affirmations to help lift you when you're low. Because sometimes the affirmations don't come so fast. But if you open a book and you read one, it might hit you for that day. And it might say, OK, I can get through this one. Gail, thank you so much for uh, sharing what you've learned and um, why you know why you wrote this book. And I mentioned earlier, you know, I lost my mom several years ago, and I too was writing notes. I was um, writing things down to remember, so I'll mostly so I'll know what to ask the doctor next time. I was also writing down my thoughts, and and if I had had, I believe, if I had this book at the time, it would have helped me to organize my thoughts a lot better. So um, thank you so much for sharing what you've learned. And yeah, there is humor, but there's also love and God loves us. And so that's that's the key right there, knowing that you can lean into him and, and he will always be there for us. So thank you for, for sharing uh, what you've learned. Yes. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah. My grandmother, she was she didn't have dementia, but I mean, I think the things in the book could, like you said, still could help as far as those affirmations and being able to, you know, write things down and 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 have like that journal piece that that you included in the book, which I think is beautiful, um, and just something that we 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 touch on the podcast all the time is identifying trauma, but also what you need. Um, for racial healing. And I think your book does a, a beautiful job on touching on both of these. Um, can you share um, what is something that the Black community needs for racial healing when it comes to dementia, when it comes to caregiving, and navigating through the healthcare system? You know, I think what the Black community needs is we just create more support groups within that community Mm -hmm. because there's so many of us going through it. And I think a lot of us need to know that we can all go through it together. Uh, That those support groups could be one that could support families and learning how to advocate uh, for their loved ones to help navigate them through these healthcare systems. Cause you know, you, you you know you're blessed if you get. You know, my mom worked for the state of Illinois. She retired from there, so they got they they have good benefits. Okay, they have good insurance, but everybody doesn't have that. And I'm thinking about the families that don't have all of that, and how do we connect with them, and how do we help them navigate when they have their loved ones going through this? So that's what I think we need to do more of is connecting with uh, organizations that can be tailored somewhat uh, and more specific targets within the, you know, within the Black community to help support us, you know, in in, in this uh, caregiving uh, process with our loved ones who suffer from dementia and Alzheimer's and all of them. Yes. Thank you. You make some great points. Um, especially just a network, um, a support system in the community. So before we leave, we, we want to let everyone know how they can purchase your book and anything else that you might want to add in. We'll, we'll also leave the details in the description for everyone. Okay. Well, um, my book goes live uh, November 4th on Amazon.com. 
I will be having a book signing on Saturday, November 11th at Fellowship Christian Church at 1106-1110 Madison Avenue, Madison Avenue in Oak Park from 2 to 5 p.m. Um, I'd like to invite everyone to come out, uh, purchase the book. We can have conversation, we have life refreshments, but just um, just so we could just continue to uh, move forward and spread this spread this word. Absolutely. Thank you so much, um, Gail, for, for sharing. And, and just a side note, that is our church, Fellowship Christian Church, where my mom is the pastor. So please come out, support Gail and her book signing, um, and also through Amazon. That's greatly needed within our community. Anything else you want to add, Ma? No, I'm just uh, really excited about uh, actually putting my hands on the book. Um, I've been look, I've been re- just reading it online, and so can't wait to start writing uh, on those lines and and meditating and uh, getting into those affirmations. I'm really excited about um, my girlfriend and how she has done a wonderful job with this book. Looking forward to spending time um, on in the morning as in during my prayer time. So thank you, Gail. Just real excited. Well, thank you both for having me here. Yes, thank you. Please support. And um, we're, we're looking forward to just being able to, to purchase when it becomes available. As always, we're, we're on YouTube, which is our newest platform. So you can listen to us on YouTube. Please like, comment, subscribe, and let us know what your thoughts of on this episode. So we'd appreciate that. Can't wait to do it again next month. So um, we'll be back with another great topic as well. So thank you everyone for, for listening. Bye-bye. 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 True You is brought to you by Radiant Vessels and sponsored by Proviso Partners for Health. Funds for True You, a storytelling space for self-discovery, were received from the Oak Park River Forest Community Foundation.